pleased to be joined today by the co-founders of the Connecticut Summerfest, composers Gala Flagello and Erin Price. In addition to serving as festival director, Gala is also pursuing her DMA at the University of Michigan, where she also completed her MM. So uh, wh where are you currently at in the program, Gala? I am currently in the second year of my DMA and I'm here physically in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Wonderful. Uh, and Aaron Price, the artistic director of the festival, earned his MM at the Hart School in Hartford, Connecticut, and is currently a visiting lecturer in music at Trinity College, also in Hartford. Um, how is that going for you? Uh, it's going well. We've made a good transition to digital and uh, all of our, the two courses I'm teaching this semester are remote and the one I'm teaching in January as well. So it's been going well. Mm. Uh, you're also a ludomusicologist, which is a fancy word for you study and write about video game music. Um, <laughs> how's that for you? Uh, it's been going well. It was interesting having uh, some of the conferences that I was presenting at this year. Uh, one of them was during Summerfest, you may remember, uh, all switched to digital. And thankfully, uh, I was able to still present at all of them uh, with no major interruption. Yeah, that, that was a, a definite feat of, of Zooming uh, that you did. And, <laughs> Yes, as, as Aaron just mentioned, uh, full disclosure, I was a part of the Summerfest last year as a composer. So welcome, both of you, uh, to my thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you um, so much for having us, Thomas. Oh, Thank my you. pleasure. Um, I wanted to start out uh, with y'all giving me a little background as to how this thing started. The way I understand it, uh, Gala, you were an undergrad at the Hart School at the same time that Aaron was in the master's program. Um, so you were composer friends, but how do you go from composer friends to saying we should start a summer program and then actually doing it. <laughs> it's, uh, it is remarkably similar to what you just said, if you can believe it, Thomas. Um, so I actually met Aaron in an orchestration class that took place in the music library at the Hart School. Um, and we just like sat next to each other the first week and like struck up a conversation and had some good times in that class with our, our dear Professor Gritch. Um, but then after that class, we would come out into the library and, you know, apply for summer music festivals in the fall, um, just like a lot of other composition students do. Um, and we were sitting next to each other one day and, you know, we were kind of like low key complaining. We're like, well, you know, I, I really like this one, but I wish it had this other element. And like, this one's really cool, but it's like so far away. And like, this one's really cool, but it's like super expensive. Like, what if we just like made our own summer festival? Like, ha ha ha, like how funny would that be? And we decided we wanted to make that joke a reality. It was, so, it was literally that offhanded. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I can't make up how offhanded it was. It was just like, we should just start our own festival. And then it was like, well, what if, what if we did? <laughs> and then yeah. six well, seasons think, later. Yeah, yeah, literally. I think too, um, it, it's also like a little bit of a personality thing too for Aaron and I, we joke that we're uh, aggressive doers. Like there's just like nothing that can stay on our to-do list. And like the two of us are just, when we're excited about something, like we were this like, mysterious idea that came out of the ether about like a summer festival in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, we just really want to go after it. And, you know, it was really awesome to have met at that time too, because that was the last two years of my undergrad and Aaron's master's was two years. So like our, our time at Hart just like perfectly lined up too for us to start it in 2016. Yeah, it's, it's really, I think, admirable that you went from a joke of starting something to actually turning it into a reality because you know it then that reminds me of, the, of uh my dad's one of my dad's catchphrases is do stuff it's just that but he like repeats yeah. it on into do stuff do stuff do stuff and that's sort of that's a that's a good motto to have is you get you get stuff done um, totally so what the nike think? pays him royalties for that <laughs> <laughs> i think he, they should obviously he, he, he should find a way to do that um so what do you think was the biggest takeaway from the first season, like getting everything started. Like, I'm, like when you're starting something this big, everyone's gonna screw up a little bit um, or a lot. And just get, kind of getting that first season under your belt so you can't have that second season. After that, I would imagine that it got a little bit easier to do once you were established. But getting established, like what was the first step? Like, do you, do you figure out the facilities? Do you contact uh, professors, ensembles? What, what was the story? So the, the first thing that we did was we actually made the schedule and we figured out here's the things that, and we'd been to a couple of festivals ourselves. And we said, well, here's the things we really like that these festival did. These festivals did this, it maybe wasn't our favorite. 
So then we sort of said, well, if we could go to our own festival and have the experience that we wanted to have, what would it be? And how many days would it be? And what would be happening on those days? Uh, and so we actually started with the schedule. And once we had a schedule, uh, we were able to then, we thought about using um, the heart facility because we were already there. And we knew that um, the community division happened in the summer, but there were sort of gaps, for example, in the beginning of June where nothing else was really happening that we could realistically reserve the facilities. Um, so then we went to uh, the, it was an interim dean at the time uh, with the schedule, uh, with our plan, with what we're gonna do. And we said, you know, would we have your support for this? Would we be able to use these facilities? And, and thankfully they uh, donated the facilities uh, for the performing spaces and the rehearsal spaces and the lesson spaces in kind that year. Um, and so then from there, we were able to create, um, we figured out what our expenses should be, uh, got quotes for some of those expenses and put together a budget. And so with a budget, reserve facilities and a schedule, we started to actually make things start to happen. Yeah, I think something else too that was unique about us having been students at the time was um, sort of being able to like play the student card in that way and say like, hey, we're young and we know we've never done this before, but like, look how exciting this is. Like, you know, here are all the reasons it's gonna be successful. Like we already paid tuition to this school, like, <laughs> you know, and also having the comp faculty's support was really important to us. Um, we, one of the first meetings I think we ever had at at Hart and at the University of Hartford was with like three or four of the comp faculty members. And they just, um, <laughs> I think it's it's important too to note that like the business plan that Aaron is mentioning was like several days of like me going to Aaron's apartment and us getting like the biggest Chipotle bowls and just like, just literally Googling like nonprofit business plan and like downloading this like 45 page chonker and like going through every single question and on like every single page, figuring out what applies to a music nonprofit, what doesn't. Um, and like really having put in a ton of hours on the front end, just like refining the idea, being able to answer any question that anyone might have for us um, because we knew coming into it as like a, you know, uh, as like a, a junior and undergrad and a first year master's student, like, you know, that might not look like the most, uh, the most sure bet, which, you know, totally wasn't. But um, I think a lot of that, that support was really helpful. And then on top of that, our faculty the first year were two heart school faculty members. So we had faculty support at the festival on top of um, Aaron knew some really incredible ensembles from other festivals he had been to in the past. So it was kind of like this convergence of like, you know, all the people we had meet and, and met and all the things that we wanted to do. Yeah, that was actually how our titles came up in the first year was that Gal was working in the administrative offices and knew who you need to contact to get X, Y, and Z things done. Meanwhile, I knew those ensembles from that year and worked together with booking them, how we were going to accommodate them, putting composers in touch with them. Uh, but as years went on, we've definitely done each other's job. Yeah, so. yeah, we joke about that a bunch too, because, <laughs> and, and especially now that we're in the virtual space for season six, it's, um, it's, it's, the jobs are very like this, it's very fluid, but it also, I think, plays to our strengths. And just like Aaron said, to our knowledge, like if I, you know, if I hadn't worked in the administrative suite at heart, I don't think I would have known half the people that we needed to talk to and half the doors we needed to knock, to knock on. And I think too, like part of the, the, you know, if, if anybody out there is looking to start their own music festival or like anything, I think it's really just the two of us were so determined. We were like, if somebody doesn't answer our email, we're going to call them. If they don't pick up the phone, we're going to we literally find their office. <laughs> if they're not in their office, we're going to talk to their administrative assistant <laughs> and like book a meeting. And I think part of it, you know, obviously like you want to be respectful and courteous while doing all of that. But I think part of it too is not just like, not just letting someone not answer your email if you really need to talk to them. And I don't know, Aaron likes to joke that like all we do is follow up. <laughs> That's true. Every other week we have a list of emails that we need answers on and we say, well, it's been two weeks. I'm writing to follow up on my previous email. Please let me know if there's any additional information I can provide. I, I've written that exact two sentence email such an unbelievable amount of times. Uh, and the other thing actually that we should mention is the, um, the Entrepreneurial Center and Women's Business Center at Park was extremely helpful on the business side. And I can tell you that just about every university has a similar resource. Um, either in the career center or something like that, that if you say, I want to start a nonprofit or I want to start a business, 
um, this is what we have so far. Can you recommend, you know, some community leaders or, or people in the community that we can reach out to? Um, how do we do this? How do we do that? Uh, and they are invested in your success, not only because they like you and they care about you, but it's, uh, it advances the institution to have successful alumni. Yeah, and, and Thomas, just to make sure we actually answer any of the questions you ask us, like, <laughs> you can tell Aaron and I are really passionate. So like, we'll talk oh, about- this is great, this is great. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about Connecticut Summer Fest all day. Um, but one of the questions you asked was like, what do you think like you didn't know in the first year that that you like learned after like got better at and I think one of those things that Aaron your comment about the women's business center really reminded me of was I don't think the first season or going into the first season we real we really knew that we had two completely separate target audiences um and we have very distinct phases of our year in running Connecticut Summer Fest so um, maybe like October through January of every year, our audience is emerging composers and like composition students and like people who might want to like come to the festival and have these opportunities um, and getting those applications rolling in um, deadline this season, January 8th. <laughs> Um, and then our second completely different audience is in the spring and summertime heading into our concert series in June, which is, you know, community members and people who would be excited to watch the live stream concert, um, fans of our ensembles and residents so that we can make sure that they know that their artist residency concerts are happening. Um, our composers, families and friends and colleagues and professors who like might want to watch their piece premieres. So. Um, it was uh, one of our mentors, um, Elena Irwin at the Women's Business Center, who was like, wait, but like you have these people and then you have these people. And we were like, she's right. <laughs> and I think it really did take us a whole season to understand that we needed to talk to two, two different groups of people very differently. And then of course, there's a third group, which is donors. Uh, which has some overlap into some of those other categories as well. Some of them are community members. Some of them are people who are, are now, I mean, we've since season one been live streaming our concerts. And that's been one of the things that our first season, we had a very low quality, uh, but functional live stream. And we learned a lot about live stream technology after the first year, right? We, we did it over Wi-Fi and we got some wobbles. We learned, oh, you got to hardwire it and we got to use this technology. We got a better camera. Um, and so every year we've gotten better. And of course, this year was sort of the pinnacle of the height of, of live stream quality. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was another thing that after our first year, uh, we hadn't done it before. So we didn't know until we did it. Yeah. Um, the so that, go ahead. Oh, sorry. The other thing that comes to mind too, now that you're talking about like the sort of concert and premiering processes, um, we actually, I think also um, expanded their recording session times. And that's not necessarily 100% applicable this year because our recordings are gonna work a little bit differently this year for virtual, but um, every in-person season, we realized after the first one, like, wow, that felt like a marathon. Like, you know, we wanna make sure that composers that come to the festival are walking away with a really beautiful studio recording that they can, you know, use for a grad school app or, you know, use for another festival in the future or, um, you know, show their comp seminar at their college or, or wherever they happen to be. Um, and that making sure that that experience is really, really good and not really rushed or like panicky. Um, basically anything that Aaron and I can do, if it's a small scheduling change to like make everyone feel like they're doing their best artistic work, that's like always the goal. You mentioned something a, a second ago that well, I wanted to get into is a really kind of small question, but there's a festival director and an artistic director. And it makes sense to split the work in, in some fashion, but what exactly does that mean for both of you in normal times? And oh, there's a cat. Yes, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm Aaron, trying please, to... please introduce us to your cat. <laughs> this is Colby because he's the cheese. Uh, he's cheesing Wonderful. right now. He thinks he's going to walk on my keyboard and he's mistaken. <laughs> Col he's, Colby he's is figured actually, out it's not happening. This is actually very relevant because Colby's our festival mascot. Like since year one, there, are, if you dig back on the Facebook, there are many pictures of Colby laying on the banner as we're trying to roll it out. <laughs> it's that was also another thing we, we learned was was with branding and everything else we just didn't have for example photos of the festival because it had never happened so our first year we had a lot of cat memes and like we had a, a, a meme with some chickens going bok 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 and it has box head on it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've seen that reposted a bunch was that something that y'all made? No. Oh, oh okay. 
Oh, well, it wasn't Stephen my just eye, so, you. yeah. <laughs> but it was funny because a lot of people do ask that, us that question. They're like, but it didn't exist, so how did you get people to come? And we were like, we just Googled cat memes. Like, <laughs> we're like, we're like, music, cats, enter. And then we're like, oh, this one's cute and funny. Like, let's send this to everybody and all of our friends. And like, I don't know, uh, where there's a will, there's a way. Sorry, Thomas, you were in the middle of a non-cat related question. I think it was about uh, the artistic versus festival director and, and how that work gets divided. Um, and I think it's um, in the context of now, uh, they're just titles that it's too much of a pain to change. And that it's, if we're being very honest, if you look at almost any other summer music festival, there is an artistic director, there is a festival director. It's generally a sort of defined uh, delineation of, of uh, the festival director deals with a lot of the uh, on the ground logistics. And the artistic director deals a lot with um, communicating with artists, booking artists, uh, accommodating artists, all those kinds of things. And they're not necessarily mutually exclusive tasks or skills. And it's come to be, for example, if uh, Gala has more of a connection to the ensembles, that she's uh, taken on some of those roles. And then uh, I've taken on, for example, uh, things like dealing with the post office or dealing with other sort of uh, administrative or logistical things where um, I said, well, I see you're doing this, so let me do this. Uh, and we kind of, like I said, we, we, we do our, each other's job just a little bit. So at this point, it's a formality just in terms of um, I think also it helps people who, who are familiar with how music festivals are, uh, but not our festival specifically, right? I, I generally tend to get emails from ensembles who want to be in residence because they see this is the artistic director, so this is who I should speak to. But then Gal and I together with our board make the decisions about who comes uh, to the festival. And we have a whole perspective list and we have all of their uh, press kits and all of their, their stuff, but right, it's, uh, but if they wanted, for example, to take out an ad in the program booklet, they might, reach out to Gala saying, oh, she's the festival director. Yeah. And so they might know that, that she would be the first point of contact. So at this point, it, it tends to be more of also um, people who are not familiar with us having a first point of contact. Totally. And and just to add on to that, Erin, like, obviously I agree because this is like how, how we work on this every day of our lives. But like, I think too, it just goes back to exactly how we assigned ourselves those titles in the first year. It's just like, who who's good at what who has a connection to do x y and z you know um a, a couple of a couple of our ensembles uh this coming year for example have um connections so it just makes a lot of sense for me to reach out to those people being a current dma student here um and one of our composition faculty members as well um where and you know aaron is still like dealing with a bunch of the ensemble stuff and like was the one to actually um, engage Zofo and like work through artist management and all of that. Um, but I think it really is just like play to your strengths, but like to the max, <laughs> like to the, to the, to the point where, you know, if there's a task on our to-do list and like Aaron knows I'm like not good at whatever that is, or like, like find it incredibly tedious, he'll just like assign it to himself and like vice versa. So I think too, just that we've known each other so long and kind of know like, you know, if I have like a budgetary question, like I'm asking Aaron about that. He's not asking me about that. Um, and, you know, if Aaron has a question about um, one of the ensembles that um, I've contracted, like vice versa. So I don't know. I think, I think too, it's just like knowing the person that is your partner in the endeavor. And then being able to delegate things to other people so that you can focus. Uh, that was another thing. Our first year, it was really uh, me and Gala and a little bit of help here and there from some volunteers and very little else. And, and now our staff is what, eight, seven? Yeah. Seven or eight, yeah. Um, Which is like so incredible. It's like we, at this point, we're basically adding a staff member every year just because like the amount of work is growing. And Aaron and I, like essentially just, we wanna be kind of having that bird's eye view whenever possible, especially when it comes to things like like concert goers and supporters and donors and scholarship donors and, um, you know, potential ensembles three years down the road. Like we want to be able to spend our time thinking about that and engaging in those conversations rather than like sending the email that so-and-so forgot to fill out their participation form. Um, and if we can have somebody who's like actually really excited to do that work to have 
you know, another really exciting line on their resume and arts admin, for example, like we want that person to, to join our team and to do that work. I, I know that coming from the sort of composer perspective then asking you after the festival is over, like you have no say in the composers who are selected to actually participate and write pieces. And that all goes to the ensembles you have in residence. Um, and, and as far as I understand it, right? Is that the, the, the performers to like have a say in, in that process? This past year, yes. Our, our adjudication oh, yeah. panel last year was 100% international contemporary ensemble members. Um, in past years, it's included composition faculty. This coming year, uh, it has two of our composition faculty and one performer. Yeah, uh, so, so it's a little okay. different every year. Um, I guess just to, to clarify in terms of the, like, the application process, we have a completely anonymous composer application. That's one of the things that Aaron, Aaron and I wanted to change from other festivals we've been to. Um, we wanted composers who were applying to be adjudicated solely on their music and what they were trying to accomplish artistically, not, oh, this is so-and-so student check mark, you know, um, and to really form those relationships with the ensemble. So like uh, Aaron and another one of our staff members, they're round one adjudicators. And it's essentially just like, is this an anonymous application? Yes or no? Um, is it downloadable <laughs> to judge? <laughs> um, and then it's passed over to our independent board of adjudicators who, as Aaron said this year, is two, two faculty and one ensemble member. I'm sorry yeah. if that like totally derails your question, Thomas. It's, no, it's, it's actually, uh, to, to play off of that and how that works is that it's actually, it's actually really good for us to have different um, adjudicators every year or some of the same or whatever, uh, because they all, uh, while they're generally professional composers and ensembles, they have different tastes. And there are plenty of, of perfectly valid composers writing great music uh, who might appeal to certain judges and not others. So if somebody doesn't get in one year, and we've had uh, people who applied in past years and then uh, finally were accepted a different year with a different adjudication panel, um, and it didn't mean that they were any less of a composer before, uh, it's just sometimes uh, different people, different tastes. And uh, we have had margins of 0.05 in scores between people accepted and not accepted. So a lot of times, you know, if we had, for example, 54 applicants and we only went to the 13th person on the wait list, plenty of people with nines and, and you know, high eights didn't get accepted and that's still, uh, and, and by the way, this is a scoring system out of 10 that we average together and we're not- it Sounds involved. like the Olympics, really. <laughs> Composer Olympics, summer fest. Um, oh, you're off by, by point one, you know, that's like, yeah, we're we have the, to do we're something. The, yeah, yeah, we're the the gymnastics of summer festivals. Oh, okay, that's <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and it was well, something that you said earlier about uh, looking at ensembles. You know, three years down the road, I know that you have kind of longer term plans uh, for the festival. It's not just what's coming next year, but also what's coming three, five years down the road. Um, how far out in advance do you try to book these ensembles? Just realistically, we try to be about a year and a half ahead. But with this year, for example, we, we made some connections in February uh, before our 2020 festival for our 2021 festival. Uh, and then COVID happened. And that derailed some of those conversations. And they said, well, now we don't know if we can do this. And oh, and we had to go back to the ensembles and say, but if we do a virtual 2021, can you still do this? So it made things a lot more complicated this past year and uh, with the International Contemporary Ensemble as well, we had to go back and change contracts and do whatever. Um, but in a non-COVID world, we're usually at least, if not more, a year and a half ahead. Yeah, and a year and a half may sound highly specific to people who like don't understand the phases of our seasons because like you look at what we, you know, the concerts we produce and the, the educational portion of the festival and you're like, well, that's a season. So like, how can you be a year and a half ahead? But it's, you know, like Aaron said, it's um, keeping that perspectives list of every, lit quite literally everyone who's ever contacted us who wants to be at the festival as an ensemble or a faculty member or a guest lecturer. Um, and then, uh, and then having those conversations and seeing, and also like seeing when the time might be right for somebody, for example, um, depending on our scheduling, especially in terms of like recording sessions and rehearsal times, um, we may have room for one or two guest lectures, le lecturers, that's how you say that word, um, or we may have room for four or five guest lectures. It like totally depends year to year. Um, so there's a little bit of, of interesting math 
and thinking ahead on that. And also, like like you said, in terms of of the adjudication process, Erin, there you know p different people like different things styl stylistically. So we like to have three ensembles and residents who who sound really different and who enjoy playing very different repertoire and very different um, aesthetics of of contemporary music. So. Um, you know, in addition to varying instrumentations, like we, I can't ever foresee us having, unless this was like some crazy special event, like three string quartets. Like we're really interested, and you know this, Thomas, like we're really interested in unique instrumentation ensembles, ensembles that are looking for repertoire and like maybe want to commission that composer they worked with in the future. Like that is, is always the goal. And that's why we always say like, it's a festival for composers by composers because that's what Aaron and I always wanted going to festivals and oftentimes ended up um, having a piece played by um, some students who were just like thrown together after they were like practicing their Mozart and they were like, oh, what is this? I don't want to play this. Um, <laughs> and we like never want another composer to have that experience when instead we could help them form this like lasting relationship with some really excellent musicians. Yeah, if you want to know some of the nuts and bolts of the logistics of why a year and a half, um, we, to, to apply for Connecticut Summerfest, we usually release our application about midway through October. So we have to know who's going to be, for example, in 2021, we have to know who's going to be there no later than October. Then if we think that we're reaching out to people in February, we can always receive no as an answer. And people can take four to six to 12 weeks to tell us no. So we have to give ourselves enough time to actually book people before October. So that's actually a, a not just because it's gonna be a year and a half away, but because we need time uh, to, to figure out the nuts and bolts of things. Um, otherwise we just, you know, we can't really ask composers like, hey, come to our festival to write for someone. <laughs> and I mean, there are festivals that do that, but again, like when, you're, when you're, your whole model is like based in collaboration and based on this idea of like, we want you to get to know these really stellar people, like, we have to be able to tell you who those stellar people are. <laughs> because then you can actually plan on your piece and not like throw something together last minute because you got the instrumentation like three weeks before the festival started. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's something too that like, you know, on the, at the beginning of this, the festival planning process back in 2015, something that I don't think we expected was you have to plan in that compositional time like for the applicants and so Aaron and I have talked a bunch about in past years like like oh what if we like moved the application season so it didn't overlap with our fundraiser like oh like you know how long could we wait until we give people until adjudicators adjudicate like how long could this app season be um and and the answer is always just like we need a we need a full stop in January because we never want to be accepting composers and giving them like three weeks to write a piece. We wanna give them three months to write a piece. And, you know, with a notification date in in mid-February, um, that's about what, what our festival composers have. And especially like 2020, maybe a little bit of an exception there, you know, there was always, there was a little bit of pivoting, a little bit of smoothing over that had to happen logistically. Um, but now that we've done that, we're going into a virtual 2020, 21 Aaron and I are just like ready and raring to go we like had all the language on the website because we like had it was almost like year one again in some ways it was just like oh my god how do we do this <laughs> and you had to switch it to online fairly quickly I mean from from March uh, I don't exactly know when the email came in from from y'all about that but you know it was in April it was, I think April. it was early April because I think we, um, I remember that for, for me, I was teaching at Trinity and uh, at spring break, which is mid-March, uh, they said, don't come back after spring break. And I was like, uh, okay. And then we had to say, well, is Hart going to tell people not to come back? And so we had to kind of wait and see. And then we found out, and as we, as we are currently still in it, uh, we said, well, how much longer can we wait to know for sure? And about April, we're like, we can't wait any longer for them to tell us what we think they're going to tell us. So we're going to have to call it virtual. Yeah. So it was a lot of like, <laughs> a lot of conversations, like so many. And the other end of pretty much all those conversations was like a big shrug emoji. <laughs> we're like, 
we don't know okay <laughs> like at some point and like I, I remember Aaron saying this a couple times on on very long phone calls that we had where it's just like we just have to make a decision like we just have to make a decision and just do it and like see what happens and since year one like we've always had this this like uh this guiding light of like Murphy's law, like what can go wrong probably will go wrong. And like, we're kind of always like, without sounding paranoid, we're like always in that mindset of like, well, what if this happens? Like what, like, what if, what if this is the situation and not this? And like, I don't know, COVID was definitely the ultimate test of that. Um, but it was, it, and we weren't even sure of the decision because we had never done a totally virtual season. Um, and, you know, we're grateful to, to you, Thomas, and like all of all of you festival composers who like really went around, along for the ride, we're like, no, we still want to do this. Um, but coming what else were we gonna do? We're stuck in we're composers stuck into our homes anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And like that's the the great thing about about this year is like we just like we we learned on the fly and like we figured out what worked and we figured out what we didn't like so much and. And it's really exciting going into this coming season, just like feeling like we have a really short plan. Whereas, you know, a lot of other festivals and a lot of other musical events um, this past season just like completely canceled. And then like even coming into this year, like 20 season 2021, like seeing like opera houses just like cancel the whole season. And we're like, wait, like there are options like that, like we could still do this. So I don't know, maybe it's just a lot of optimism. <laughs> well, the fact that it's such a small festival like you're not talking about bringing in you know 50 composers and a whole roster of other like um you know masters and, and doctoral students in performance as well and trying to put something together like that which a lot of other festivals really you can't do that um right. but you actually have the ability from... you have the ability to do that and it's it's really good that you're able to pursue that Right, we benefit also from from being primarily chamber music. So we don't have, for example, this coming year, any ensembles that are more the poor people. Mm -hmm. So they can more safely gather in a place and record and, and um, rehearse than an orchestra. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Aaron and I have, have talked about before, like, like would, would we ever expand the, the festival composer side of the festival? Like, would we ever want um, 18 composers instead of nine? Because um, we've both been to festivals where there are like no joke 40 composers um which like had you know had some some really great experiences had some less great experiences but what we both really like is that that intimate like that intimate setting where you get to really know all literally all of the other people um including all the ensemble members we've had actually from our 2019 festival into the 2020 season we had a festival composer who just got to be really good friends with an ensemble that she didn't write for. And then the following year was commissioned by them. Um, so those kinds of connections, I don't know. I know this is definitely not like the logistical side. This is more of the like ideological side. Um, yeah, logistically, we definitely benefit from that. But also I don't, I think at this point, Aaron and I have kind of decided like we, we wouldn't have it any other way, even if we could. It's a magic number. It all just the schedule fits. Everything works. Three, three, three. We love it. <laughs> yeah, right. It, it is. It was quite nice to be because I, I have experienced the other side of that coin with like forty composers. You, you can be stuck physically, you know, in person in the same place for a month, and you still don't know everyone there as well as you would like for a week's worth of just constant Zoom sessions with nine folks. Like it's it, it for me it feels like you actually are maybe it's just a psychological thing but you really it feels like you are actually build, building more connections versus just like oh that's someone I knew at the summer festival and we're friends on Facebook but we don't really interact <laughs> that sort of thing they I like my like memes <laughs> <laughs> yeah I was gonna say I feel like we we all have like that category of people like any composer who's gone to like big summer festivals is just like I recognize that name and that it's like. We were, we were Facebook friends starting three years ago when I went to that festival. Oh, that's mm -hmm. interesting. Um, and you know, some of those, some of those things end up, you know, you end up actually having some like really, really awesome friends from, from larger festivals as well. It's definitely not to say that that's not true. Um, but I think having founded a festival on this idea of like, like tight collaboration um, and like wanting to collaborate for a longer period of time, not necessarily like, you get in the room for rehearsal one and it turns out rehearsal one is basically a dress rehearsal and then like you know the recording session is actually the premiere which is like kind of sight read and like 
<laughs> you know, like you don't get that, that like actual musician to musician connection with your ensemble. And just like the idea that you have an ensemble and it's sort of like you're in this like little, little group. And that's, that's the thing is we're a composition festival. Uh, we're not a performance festival that on year three or four slapped on a composition program. Yeah, Which some of them are great the and whatever, but yeah, yeah <laughs> you you know uh, uh, where I might be talking about, but it's uh, it's a totally different experience because we don't have any student performers really, mm -hmm. or if they're students, they're masters or doctoral students. You know what I mean? They're not there to learn to perform. They are professional performers there to work with living composers. And a lot of the times, the the performance students I talk to at these at, at summer festivals are just they're run ragged with everything they have to do, and they don't. They, they're doing it more for the, like the sake of putting it on a resume at some point, like building the professional connections versus actually playing music they enjoy. And I just think that's kind of sad. Like if you, if you want to play new music, then you should be able to just do that without having to like be rushed to play, you know, 12 pieces on one concert and have a week to put it together. Yeah, um, that was, that was something that, that we, the two of us talked a lot about in terms of to that, like that, magic number nine for festival composers was like you know how 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 many pieces and at what length makes a concert that people want to actually stay all the way through when it's contemporary music and like every single piece is really really different like you know what what is that length of time how many people is that and so a lot of I think a lot of those structural decisions came from came from a standpoint of like never wanting people to feel run racket and mm -hmm. always wanting people to feel feel like they would rather come back for more new music than like get super tired of it. And I I'm just always and like this is a testament to your work, Thomas, and like all the other festival composers we had this year. Like I'm always like floored at the first of all, the aesthetic differences of all of the composers that come, like nobody's writing the, the, the same music or in the same style necessarily. And like, then on top of that, getting to really have high quality recordings that like the ensemble is proud of in addition to the composers and the composer feels like really represents what they were going after. Like, you know, the, I'm, I'm, I think all three of us probably have recordings of pieces that we love, but the recording itself is like, oh, like <laughs> that doesn't sound like what it sounded like in my head. <laughs> and we always want composers to, to walk away being like really excited to like post that video on their website and, um, you know, send it to all, all of their family or friends that couldn't make the concert. We do court the ensembles as well. Their schedule for the festivals, essentially they have three rehearsals a day on the pieces that were written for the festival. And one of the days of the festival, uh, they also have, uh, in addition to the premieres concert, they have their own concert of music. And I'm talking about the, the in-person, right? The, the digital is a little bit different. Um, so while they're in residence, right, their uh, rehearsal schedule to work on anything else or to go back and say, well, we had 40 minutes with this composer, but you know, we should really make some time to spend a little more time on this. Um, they have that kind of time and flexibility and they don't, as you said, they're not run ragged at our festival. They have, you know, a two, two hour rehearsal block, sometimes also a concert. Yeah. And, that's and, that, their day. and that, that too comes back to your very first question, Thomas. I feel like we're going to come back to the first question of like, what have you <laughs> learned? Like, oh man, have we learned so many lessons? Um, but something that you said, Aaron, that that reminded me of was that rehearsal schedule piece of things. Um, especially in our 2018 and 2019 seasons, I remember more and more ensemble members and ensembles as a whole were asking us like, hey, can we, can we get the room unlocked early? Like, can we get into the space earlier? Like, we really want to run so-and-so's piece, like, or like, we all practiced this last night and we like want to make sure it's stuck for this morning and, or like, we just really want a great warm up. Like, can we get in an hour early or like, um, you know, booking that extra space and that extra time for the ensembles, especially when in in-person festivals, the facilities, like Aaron said, it's kind of between two different seasons for the community division. So it's like, it's basically like our space a lot of the time, which is amazing. Um, it's really, it's really great to have that opportunity and also to have ensembles that feel comfortable coming, like talking to us and being like, like, hey, this is what I need to be successful. Um, and not just not having like students that feel like they can't ask that question or having, you know, ensembles we've like never talked to before who, who like don't want to talk to us either. You know, like we're, we're really, really happy to be working with ensembles and with comp faculty and with festival composers who feel comfortable asking for what they want for and what they, what they want and what they need. 
That was the, um, when we did that business plan that you talked about, that was like so many pages. Um, one of the questions they asked us about was branding and what are some of the words that are important to us. And actually one of those words was being approachable. Yeah. Yeah. So I tell people I'm only scary on the phone, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Aaron has a really excellent phone voice. <laughs> we can, we could bring that out at some other time. <laughs> some other time. Oh, yeah. 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 But that's true. And I mean, I think, I mean, especially the first few years and like, even still now, uh, like a lot of festival composers who meet us for the first time, they're like, oh my God, you guys are so young. And we're like, and, and like that used to make me feel like really insecure because I was like, oh my God, like, is this, is this a, secretly a mess? And like, I don't know. And I'm just like a little girl or something, but like, no, like what they meant was like, what you've accomplished in this period of time is incredible. And I feel like I can actually come talk to you because you're not like, some shadowy person on a pedestal I've never seen before like that I top the ivory tower ivory <laughs> yeah like like you know especially as somebody who's like organizing something that's like like for composers and like for new music lovers like you know if we if we can't communicate with those people in a way that's going to make them feel like they had a great experience like you know that's not worth our time we want we want everyone to feel um to feel like they were at their like creative best where does this really uh, go from here because you know you started th this out with a very sort of let's get at it let's let's just make this thing happen um and you haven't rested on your laurels you're just you're always doing something next you, you've, you've moved everything online last minute um you were very proactive in moving the next year all the way online which gives you a lot more time to get everything uh situated instead of running around last minute uh, digitally speaking um but what are some of the long-term plans for, for the Summer Festival, the two, three, five, ten years down the road? One of the things that was a long time coming and is now finally coming in this year is our pay what you wish application fee for the composition program. Um, and that is something that Aaron and I had talked about and just became, as we, as we gained more supporters and got uh, older as an organization, it became more financially feasible to to be able to you know project what what that might cost us as an organization to speak like completely logistically um you know and once once you have a, a certain revenue model it can be really difficult to to have a different revenue model um but it's something that we really wanted for accessibility um we want anybody who writes music from any socioeconomic background to be able to apply to this festival um, and to not just have it be a festival for people that have, you know, in the case of some festival applications, an extra $125 to, to throw at this computer system for somebody to read one PDF. Like, you know, in, instead of that, like, what can we do so that any composer can apply um, and pay what you wish is what we came up with um, for for this season and that was like a f at least a few years in the making so we're really excited to have that um, happening this year and hey we'll, we'll keep you posted like this is year year one of that so so we'll see how everything shakes out but we've had really really good reactions to that so far right and another thing is um, our publishing partnership with just the theory press which we can now finally can formally announce uh, that uh, Josh DeVries from um, Just the Theory Press will be looking at all the pieces from uh, the festival that are written for it. Uh, and composers, if they choose, can reach out and have a consulting session with him uh, to talk about whether they might want their piece to be published going forward on uh, Just the Theory Press, which is sort of a unique thing. Uh, we haven't seen it too many festivals yet. Maybe it'll catch on. He'll, he'll <laughs> yeah. talk about Stimlets, but most likely. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Josh has got some some really really good engraving opinions. We love it. Um, yeah, so that was that was another thing too that was kind of in the in the works for for you know a season or two, um, and a lot of these things too. I just want to say grow out of either something that's that a festival composer suggests suggested to us a conversation we have with a guest lecture as in the case with Josh who I know from here at UM but I was like oh man that would be a great guest lecture and that's like why he did the engraving and publishing lecture at Connecticut Summer Fest 2020 and then he was like hey so want a partner and we just had a, a really great conversation about that and it seemed like a great opportunity for our festival composers um, and then hopefully 
down the line, the the next big thing that is publicly announced, so we can also say this to some of some of the other plans we gotta like keep in the shadows still. Um, but the the next big endeavor for us is our tuition free initiative, um, which was generously kickstarted by the Impact Award, which we were uh, awarded by the Excel Lab and the Metalweiser Fund here at the University of Michigan. Um, and that was an award that we won for Impact, as one would imagine <laughs> from the name Impact Award. Um, the This idea of using music and the performing arts to try and to do something good. Um, and for us, that was our pay what you wish application fee and our gender diversity scholarship and our composers of color scholarships. Um, another big thing this year is we're trying to give more scholarship than ever before to our festival composers um, to elevate those underrepresented voices. Um, so tuition free is like the max level of the whole like accessibility um, goal, um, which is basically just like quite like if, no matter what your background is, um, and no what no matter what your financial situation looks like, you you'll be able to come to the festival. Um, and yes, that is definitely a long term goal. Um, it definitely includes uh, large scary financial things like an endowment raise. <laughs> so and it's funny because Aaron and I always joke like you know we're we're just gonna start our own college one day. <laughs> so maybe we're on the path. Um, but yeah, it's something we're excited about and something that is definitely a long term goal. But we're we're getting closer every year. Um, and we're really proud to be able to say that. Yeah, a lot of these are their processes and not necessarily events. Yeah, right. well, people people yeah. sort of underestimate what the expenses actually are for us to have five days of events. And it's it's shocking when you actually see the numbers sometimes, right? We have to have food. I mean, this is, of course, talking about an in-person festival, uh, food, housing, accommodations. Uh, we have to, thankfully, the, the rehearsal spaces are in kind. That's always helped our tuition be just a little lower already off the top. Uh, booking all of the ensembles, booking all of our composition professors, um, booking our guest lecturers, all these expenses just start to pile up and up and up and up. Uh, printing charges, right, advertising fees. Um, it's surprising that there's uh, certain fees that people don't know about, for example, uh, to be incorporated as a business in Connecticut, you have to pay a fee to the Secretary of State of Connecticut every year. Things that you wouldn't know until you're in it, and all of a sudden you get this bill and you're like, why do we owe this money? Uh, <laughs> ASCAP and BMI fees, right? There's there's all kinds of, of things that you don't always expect. And that's, this is looping back to your first question about what did we learn from year one, right? About licensing fees and business fees and all of these things that until we actually went to do it, we didn't know were a thing. Yeah. And that's not because we're stupid. It's because we didn't have any reason to know it. Yeah. And then there, it also, that's also a great, a great segue into this idea of like, like time and the value of time and like there are on on one end there are only so many hours in a day and Aaron and I are both also freelance composers and like I'm in school and Aaron teaches at Trinity <laughs> and uh like we both have private students and so on top of that it's like oh yeah we also run this nonprofit, ha 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 um <laughs> but on the other side of the spectrum because like that's like us you know running around super busy doing the day-to-day and then on the other side of the spectrum, it's this like super long-term planning. And every year we have a sort of festival, big festival debrief after the end of the festival. Um, and Aaron and I, you know, typically we like get to go out to lunch together and do this. It's very chill. We get some bubble, bubble tea. tea. Yeah, <laughs> bubble tea is our thing. Um, and this year we we did it over the phone and, and just like, you know, shared a Google doc with so many bullet points on it. Um, but it was really just like, what did we really like about this year? What did we not like so much? What can we do to change those things? Um, if we like, you know, five years down the line, 10 years down the line, like what's the ultimate goal? Um, and something like tuition free is like in that category. Whereas like, you know, this, like for this coming season, it was pay what you wish. It was as many gender diversity and composers of color scholarships as possible. Um, it was how can we have the the most the highest quality and least stressful video recording at a distance as possible <laughs> and just thinking through those logistics with um shout out to our incredible recording engineers will and brandon from kinsman sound in boston um they're 
really great and also um are, are really like I think like a lot of recording engineers stay stay calm when a lot of people around them are like oh my god how do we make this happen um just having people that we trust and we've worked with for a long time um have those conversations with us and help us plan for the future is really helpful and uh as a shameless plug uh it is the at the time that this is being recorded it's december 2020 uh, if any of your viewers are interested in helping us make that happen or just learning about the festival, coming to our concerts, right? Our website is ctsummerfest.org. If any uh, emerging composers are out there are saying, you know, this sounds like the experience for me, all of our application information is up there as well. Mm -hmm. And just like Aaron said, uh, application season is right now. So I don't know when this will be posted, Thomas, but the deadline is January 8th, 2021. Uh, for this season. And then we're also doing our annual giving campaign right now, um, which runs until the new year. And that will help support those live streams we were talking about and the ensembles and the faculty and the guest lectures and the adjudicators and like just everything. <laughs> um, so this will, this will be posted before then. I just, you know. <laughs> nice, nice. To reassure yeah. you, it doesn't, doesn't do much good at when, it, when the ninth hits. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But I mean, that's the thing is like year round, we have vo like volunteers who help us and just people we've known all along the way since 2015, um, who just like love the festival and like want to support Aaron and I, um, and all of our contemporary music endeavors. So it's really exciting to, to sort of grow the Connecticut Summerfest family, um, and see people coming back to the live stream concerts like year after year after year and, and telling us like, oh my God, the quality was so good this year. And, and like, wow, like we can't believe you pulled this off in 2020. And <laughs> um, that means a lot to us. Yeah. As a final wrap up question, you know, we've talked a lot about the Summerfest, but what are y'all up to? As a, I mean, in addition to, to being a doctoral student and a professor, um, what, what's going on compositionally? Yeah, totally. Um, right now, the big project is I'm writing a one act opera for um, a small company in Boston called Promenade Opera Project. Um, and they will hopefully, fingers crossed with the COVID situation, premiere this opera in August or September 2021 um, in Boston. Uh, so we we shall see, but really excited. This is probably the largest scale project I've taken on and I'm really, really excited to be working with them. Um, and then the two small projects that um, I'm in, involved in right now are actually two miniatures projects. Um, one was to support the coalition of African-American performing artists. Um, so that was like donated commission fee to have somebody perform this piece um, and all proceeds go to that. So that was a super exciting project. And then the other one is for the Georgia runoff campaigns. Um, and that's really exciting to be participating in as well. So just whipping out these one minute pieces all week. <laughs> um, and that's been an awesome break from uh, big, big opera time. <laughs> yeah, are you at liberty to tell us uh, more about what the opera is about or is that uh, how It is, is. Uh, I, I will say it generally, it is a comedy, uh, which is not, not, too common in new opera, but I'm, exci I'm excited to be representing the, the comedic side of things. Uh, definitely dark comedy, <laughs> uh, but it is, uh, it is, I like to call it a, uh, all the opera tropes slapped together with like a feminist critique lens. So like whatever that means to you, that's what it is. And then like, you know, there's a, there's a big funny death scene. Very funny. Well, what that means is that uh, if, if Brenda's, you know, has me stay on for the uh, for the doctoral program. I'm I'm t I'm hopping on the train and going nine miles that way. <laughs> hey, would love to, would love to see you there, and hopefully we will be able to have a large group of people. <laughs> I, I am I'm hopeful about that time. My my roommate not not so much. He thinks his church choir is going to come back in like 2025. I'm like it's going to be sooner than that. I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Aaron, what about you? Uh, well, actually, Gal and I, I believe, Gal, you also wrote a piece for Hub New Music that's being premiered next summer. Yeah, I'm working on that. That's, that's later. That's later. It's later. Okay. You were busy. You were staying We're, busy, Gal. Wow. Yes. <laughs> uh, so that's, uh, that's coming up. And then uh, I also, right, with, with everything going on with COVID and we've been dealing with everything virtually, right, I'm actually uh, working on a piece uh, with the baritone singer Marcus Shank, who's another connection right to Promenade. Uh, it's small, small world out there. Uh, and uh, I'm composing a piece for uh, bass, baritone, and electronics. 
because then he'll be able to perform the piece right in the comfort of his home using a fixed media uh, electronics track. Um, and then, of course, going forward, other bass baritone singers will be able to perform that without having to be in a physical space, so to speak. So it's a, uh, a great way to sort of be able to adapt to these troubling times. <laughs> I hear that phrase one more time. <laughs> Are you sure you don't want to end these troubling times by a Toyota? Because that's oh. usually how it's put. <laughs> troubling, unprecedented. <laughs> I'm sorry, in this house, we celebrate happy Honda days. But uh, <laughs> make this a December to remember, salesman. <laughs> So, <laughs> I was going to wish you a happy Toyota thon. So I'm just, I'm glad we got that out of the way. That's good. You almost made a serious and grievous error. No, but uh, <laughs> yeah, what, what's the text for this, for this piece? Oh, it's the, uh, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Uh, so the, the T.S. Eliot is, has recently come into the public domain. So thankfully now we can all hound on to it. Um, <laughs> but it's also the themes of the poem really do apply to the COVID situation. There's these, these feelings of listlessness and anxiety and this sort of desire for things that are very far away uh, and thinking about other people around. So it just, as I was reading that, you know, uh, it was uh, in, in February or March um, and everything was starting to happen with the quarantines and people were just starting to be isolated. Uh, and I said, gosh, this is really actually extremely relevant even though at the time it was written, it was obviously not during a, a pandemic. So I'm looking forward to it. It's gonna be a good time. Yeah, well, thank you for being here and good luck with your personal projects and with the summer festival and uh, stay safe and keep on keeping on, I suppose. Thank, Thank you, you. Thomas. same to you. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm.